This meeting of the Independent School District 535 School Board is called to order at 5.30 p.m. Tuesday, September 5, 2017 in room 137 of the Edison Building. Present at the board table is Mr. Michael Munoz, Superintendent of Schools and a non-voting ex officio member of the board. Also present is Ms. Wendy Edgar, the Assistant Board Clerk. Ms. Edgar, would you please call the roll? Mr. Barlow? Here. Mrs. Becker? Here. Ms. Marvin? Here. Mr. Schlusner? Here. Ms. Seelinger? Here. Mr. Smith? Here. Chair Workman? Here. Mr. Munoz? Yes, tonight we have the pleasure to be led in the pledge by students from Riverside Central Elementary. Approval of the agenda. This is an action item. Mr. Munoz, are there any changes to the agenda? No changes. Move approval. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Announcements and communications. 3.01. First day of school. Mr. Munoz. Yes, I'm going to start off and then uh, Heather has a, a video that she'll share with us. But. Uh, as uh, I want to give you an update on our current enrollment, but just to remind you that this is going to fluctuate a little bit, can go up or go down. The official count is not till October 1st, but today uh, we're at 17,987 students, which is, uh, I think we're at 17,646 last year, so uh, a little bit larger than when we anticipated, but like I said, that could fluctuate a little bit uh, before our official count on October 1st. Uh, one of the things that I've been keeping you informed on is the immunization and, and I think I shared with you the plan we had for today and for Thursday. I want to give you a little update on, on that. Um, we had, currently have 66 kindergarten students that uh, need to submit immunization or the waiver form, uh, which uh, seems like a large number. but. On June 21st, it was 696 kindergartners, and on August 31st, it was 74. So we're bringing that number down, and uh, like I said, their first day of school was on Thursday. Uh, if we look at seventh grade, uh, 61 students. On June 21st, it was 639. August 31st, it was 78. Uh, if we look at grades one through six, it's 12 students. On June 21st, it was 54. August it was 14 and we look at 8 through 12th it's nine students uh, on June it was 53 and August it was 11 uh, updated the most updated numbers at the end of today uh, we started out with 57 uh, students first grade through 12th grade that we were going to have to exclude and not let them attend classes by the end of the day, it was down to 36. Um, as we look for Thursday, we have 52 kindergarten and early childhood special ed students that we do not have, uh, excuse me, do not have uh, the immunization records and, wait a minute, sorry. We have, for kindergarten and early childhood, we have 52 students on the list for exclusion. So we'll see what happens on Thursday. Uh, just a reminder, um, this was a, a great partnership with Mayo Clinic, Olmstead County Public Health, and 
Olmstead County OMC Medical Center. Uh, and we had arranged for them to have uh, set up for students that we could uh, take to those three sites to get their immunizations. Uh, I had the pleasure to spend the morning at the uh, mail site and um, they had quite a setup. They had volunteers there on the first level to escort students and families up to the third floor. You went up to the third floor, they had interpreters, they had other individuals there to work with families and then they took me down to the hallway where they had several nurses lined up to give the immunizations and I think we had something very similar at the other three sites. Um, it's just a, a great partnership that we have with these three organizations and uh, this has been several months of meeting to get ready for the beginning of the school year and, and it was uh, quite amazing that I think it was just a week ago we met with them and said can we do something the first day first day of school and they quickly put something together and we'll do the same thing on Thursday uh, for kindergarten students and any other students that we weren't able to capture today uh, they can also have the opportunity to go down and get their immunizations taken care of on Thursday so that's an update on that and I think at this time I'll have Heather share the video uh, about the first day of school. Oh, thank you for those individuals for doing that. Three point oh two recognitions, Mr. Munoz. Okay, I'm just going to grab all my papers so I don't come back multiple times here. I'm pleased to inform the board that John Carlson recently received the Certi Certified Administrator of School Finance and Operations or CFO certification. CFO certification is granted to highly qualified individuals who fulfill multiple requirements including providing equality through experience work, work experience and education passing a comprehensive two-part exam that tests competency in accounting and school business management topics and adhering to the ASBO International Certification Code of Conduct. CFO certification demonstrates a commitment to high standards and ethical practice in school business management. Congratulations to John. Thank you. Um, I guess part of it is just uh, enough time has passed. I've had uh, six years here at the school district. You need at least five to be able to take the test, and then I passed the two tests this summer. So I was thankful that I had um, a couple extra hours to do the studying and prep for that this summer. So uh, thank you again for all the professional development opportunities you provide our staff. Um, I'm able to take part of that too, and um, that's what allowed me to get to where I am today. So thank you. Okay, this is a little bit of a catch up. We uh, didn't do the last couple of months of uh, above and beyond, so would like to recognize the May and June staff who received or nominated for the above and beyond and I want to share a couple of examples with you. Uh, the first one is Ginger who works at Edison in insurance claims. Ginger goes above and beyond in supporting staff in our insurance department. She is thoughtful and thorough in answering questions. She is always kind and helpful. We need more people like Ginger in this world. Another example is uh, Jane from Gage Elementary. Jane is the first person you see when you walk in the door and she makes an impression right from the start. She is consistently professional and she is kind, even in the most challenging situations. Jane can handle all different kinds of situations and she does it with patience and wisdom. As a parent, I'm very grateful for all she does at Gage. 
and I feel she creates a safe and warm place for my own children. Her, I, she goes above and beyond to the minimum required in arriving at a level of excellence. Congratulations to all the winners. And then something new this year, we have Melissa coming up and join me. The Rochester Area Foundation has decided to help us recognize these individuals. Okay, excuse me. Rochester Public Schools Foundation, sorry. Can somebody draw And the winner is, drum roll please. Okay. Um, so I put all the names in a bucket and we drew one out. And so one lucky winner every time they're recognized will get a $25 gift card of, of their choice from our local area business from Rochester Public School Foundation. Um, part of our mission is to encourage and support um, teachers and staff. And so we're very privileged to be able to partner with the district in this way to recognize our staff. Thank you. Thank you. I never got to stand over here before, and this is kind of cool. Um, we had two board members who completed, completed phase three of the Minnesota School Board Association training. And during phase three, they learned all about decision making, stages of board development, navigating board dynamics, and had small group interactions with school board video scenarios. Um, so I would like to congratulate um, Mr. Barlow and Mr. Schlusner for completing phases one, two, and three. Now you have one more to go and then you will have all four. So if you would please come forward and receive your certificate. Point oh three back to school week summary, Mr. Munoz. Yes, yeah, so just to re remind you, I think last board meeting we gave you a copy of the actual uh, booklet that had all the courses that we offered. Uh, there were 145 sessions offered, and we had about 128 different educators, and many of those were our own staff. Uh, from topics targeting culturally relevant tech teaching, technology, best practices and instruction, trauma-informed educational practices, and more. Uh, some of the sessions were required for staff to attend. I think I shared with you uh, some of the equity work. We did uh, require uh, all K through eight teachers who have not been trained in Envoy to uh, do those for two days. Uh, and then the others were able to self-select uh, from a variety of different sessions which you saw in that booklet that we shared with you last meeting. We also invited paraprofessionals and gave them an opportunity to sign up for courses as well. We're just now kind of had a, going through the, we do a survey with uh, all those that participated and we really hadn't had a time to go in a lot of detail and depth, but just a quick summary. Uh, when we asked uh, if they found Tuesday morning session to be uh, beneficial to their growth, 44.6% um, found it very beneficial and 36% found it beneficial. And then we asked them the same question about the afternoon sessions and 32% found it very beneficial and 37% found it uh, beneficial. And then we did the same thing about 
Wednesday. And 49% found Wednesday morning very beneficial and 33% found the afternoon beneficial. And then we asked them the same thing about the afternoon and 42% found it very beneficial and 33% found it beneficial. And then we asked them if they liked the uh, format as, you know, instead of doing the big district welcome and all of that, we asked them about the format of the week and 71% answered that it was very positive. They enjoyed that type of format. And then we uh, asked them about the accommodations and the schedule, the location, presenters, and parking. And 35% found it extremely satisfied and 58% found it they were satisfied. So that's just a quick summary. We haven't had a lot of time to go through all the uh, specific uh, details and suggestions and recommendations. Uh, but just as always, we look at that and that helps us plan uh, what we're going to do next year. I think I, we shared with you that um, since some of the staff were required to do the Envoy training, we talked about providing some of the breakout sessions in October and November as well. So we'll uh, look at the feedback from each specific session and, and take the ones that uh, had positive feedback and those that were uh, people who signed up but weren't able to get into it because it was full and offer some of those uh, later this school year. Three point oh five school board committee assignment. Did I miss one? A graduate profile, I'm sorry. Three point oh four graduate profile, Mr. Munoz. I'm okay. giving him a little extra time to Yeah, sort I do. I need to get through papers. the right papers here. Perfect. If you recall, we had a conversation about uh, updating our strategic plan and one of the things that we agreed to do is to work with our stakeholders to create a graduate profile. And then from that, we will take that information and update the strategic plan. So just kind of want to give you a timeline that we have uh, developed for this work. So end of September through mid-November is when we will be having the graduate profile conversations with uh, our community and staff and students. Uh, some of that will be uh, done where we'll have sessions and people can physically attend and the others we will use uh, some form of technology to get their feedback and uh, we just recently uh, did a webinar with a, a, a firm that does um, it's a little bit different than surveys. It's kind of like surveys, but it's not a survey where do you like this, yes or no. It's here's a question, and then you post your comments, but others can see the comments, and then you have a conversation online about that, that question. Uh, so we may look at doing that uh, as well as having the physical sessions where people can come and have conversation. And then in December, uh, December 19th, uh, we tentatively have put down a study session for the board and the cabinet to review uh, all the information we collected and hopefully uh, create a graduate profile and start having conversations about the core values and see if we want to make some changes in our current core values. And then another study session uh, on January 23rd to continue that work. And then February 6th, we would present uh, the strategic goals uh, for the entire board to officially approve. Hopefully by then we'll have that work done. Uh, and then if it's approved on February 6th, the plan is for the cabinet to spend January, February through April to create action plans for the two, uh, two goals, or if we have more than two goals, but I would suggest that we not do more than two. Uh, two goals and then in May the board would officially approve the the full strategic plan which would go in effect for the following uh, school year. So that's kind of a, a timeline that we put together 
uh, still working out some of the specifics and the types of questions that we should uh, use to facilitate the conversations with the stakeholders on the graduate profiles. Okay, any questions? If yes, if I may. Uh, so while this is uh, entitled graduate profile, it also encompasses the uh, strategic plan. And um, so where is the um, emphasis being placed or is it just a combination of or is this uh, a first um, time effort to um, include the graduate profile as a part of the strategic plan or campaign? Yeah, we talked, about, I can't even remember how long ago we talked about this, but the graduate profile is we're going to ask our stakeholders, what, what do you want our graduates to have when they walk across the stage, what do you want of those students? And then from that, it's going to be the, role, the goal of the board and the cabinet to establish hopefully no more than two goals that what are we going to have to do to accomplish what our community tells us they want our graduates to have. And then after that, it's going to be the charge of the, the cabinet and, and others to create how we're going to make those goals happen. And then in May, we'll bring it all back to the board for a formal approval on, on the, the, well, we'll have approval from the board already on the graduate profiles, but on the goals and action plans in order to accomplish those. And I think, I appreciate the clarification. I guess in my mind, I, I heard you speak to it there that uh, it's possible, I'm not saying uh, this district has done that, but it's possible to have a strategic plan without necessarily having a, what a community wants their graduates to have when, it, when they graduate from a school system. Is that correct? Yeah, when we, we created the, the current strategic plan that we've been uh, actually using since I, I think we started in 2012, um, we had guiding questions, but I don't think they were really directed at what do you want our graduates to have when they leave our system. And we're thinking having those conversations is going to give us better information on what our community wants, our students' uh, skills, qualities, and things that they want them to have when they leave, leave our school system. And then as a group, as a team, the cabinet and the board will determine what goals do we want to set and I think we earlier we had a conversation about those goals probably need to be a little more specific uh, than the current goals that we have on our current strategic plan uh, so we'll have clear more specific goals which be much easier for us to uh, report to the board on the progress we're making on those thank you Ms. Marvin I, I just have a comment I'm really looking forward to this I think it's so healthy when the district really engages the, the whole community to find out what their perspective is. And I think it's going to be fascinating um, to hear from everybody, you know, what, what should we expect um, that our kids are going to know and be able to do by the time they finish our schools. So I just think it's going to be a wonderful, positive, um, very open experience. And um, I, you know, I can hardly wait to hear what people are going to say. We might get some really new, great ideas. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Three point oh five. School board committee assignment updates. Board members. Mr. Schlusner. I have a couple of updates. The first one is I met with the Rest of Public School Foundation. And we're getting together information so they can have a grant cycle this year. When we have the details of that, we'll get it out to the educators. Hopefully through, we were initially thinking at the district meeting where the building administrators get together. Just an easy way to communicate to the different schools the grant opportunity from the Public School Foundation. And the other committee assignment is the long-term strategic plan where we talk about facility needs. Uh, it's, it's really becoming clear, especially after the update of what our school student population is today, where the district's getting fairly full and there's starting to be needs for facilities. Uh, we're looking closely at that and we're probably going to have some community involvement as well of discussing potential alternative ideas as well. Director Smith and Ms. Becker were part of those discussions as well. Did you want to add anything to the strategic 
plan update? Well, I, I just want the, um, I just want to let the board know that we really hope that we'll have um, some costs also associated with um, the different options. Um, you know, there are different things we've you know talked about, scheduling differences, um, um, adding on to buildings, just you know going a more traditional route, just building a whole nother building. Um, we we're very aware that no matter what option we do, we are going to incur more cost because we just have more students. So we'll need more staff and and but we're just we're trying to figure out you know, what will the capital costs actually be and can we minimize those how can we look at the facilities that we have right now um, can we use them a little bit more efficiently um, is that something that the public wants I mean we we will really want the public to weigh in on on these different options that we're that we're presenting yeah, I think I, mean, I think maybe you know one of the things would be out of the box thinking a little bit for instance how many people in this community work second shifts how many students does that involve is there an opportunity where people might like their students to be in school at the same time they're working so they could be spend more family time together I mean these are fairly I mean if you're doing that we're using our facilities longer than we are in the normal day which means you don't have to build but you know it's also a different schedule and different way uh, of looking at the school day that is you know, I guess some people might think it might be a little radical, but uh, that's where we got to have the public discussions. We're not going to about to go around and suggest that we impose something uh, that people really don't want want to try. So we'll have to do a, a lot of homework and have a lot of public discussion about this, and then and look at the alternatives that uh, make the most most sense because there will be some cost savings over some alternatives versus the others, but those will also will mean some lifestyle changes for a lot of folks and and. Uh, so a lot of things to discuss with that. We're a long ways from, from being there, but uh, we are really trying to look at every option that might be available uh, to minimize capital costs, as has been alluded to. We know we have more students, and more students is going to be more teachers. There's going to be more, mean, more operating costs. That's, that's a given. Uh, more students, more operating costs. So uh, we're trying to do the best we can and try to get as many options that make sense for uh, the board and the community to well, the community and then hopefully the board uh, to consider, so. And I just had a question. I know it's probably, uh, you may not have had an opportunity to, to discuss it, but in uh, light of uh, the recent ruling, DACA ruling, uh, while we have spoke primarily of student increases, the possi there may be a possibility that there could be a decline of some sort um, I do know that uh, some of the major employers here in, in Rochester have, you know, their position was that it, it be extended. It wasn't. And so was there any consideration as to that impact that it might have upon the workforce to then domino effect uh, potentially have within uh, uh, our enrollment? Uh, Dr. News is more recent than when we had sure. the meeting. Yeah. One thing. I'd like to ask a question. So if we're, um, you named a, a number of, of possibilities, one of which was a new building. Does that involve the purchase of land or do we already have land? Well, <clears throat> what they've asked us to do is to, um, as Ann stated, looking, try to um, estimate what it would cost to, to build something. So you are gonna to have to include the purchase of land, the, the cost of, of building the building and try to anticipate the staffing cost, as well as looking at could we add on to, what sites do we have physically space where we can add on to those and try to determine what the cost would be to do that. And then uh, they also mentioned looking at can we have our buildings open longer uh, similar to what the ALC does, They're, they go from 7.30 to 7. They have a different group of students that come in uh, midday and go later into the end of the day, and they have different staff that don't start in the morning, a different group comes in later. So, we're, you know, I think it's, it, it's great that uh, I think what we can demonstrate to our stakeholders is that we're looking at every option, and then we're going to get your input on all those options. 
Uh, the only thing I, and I'll, I'll say this when we're having these meetings, that the, the dollar amounts that we're going to throw out there are really going to be really rough estimates just because until you know exactly what you're going to build and how big you, you need to build it, you can't get really that close. But I think we can get a ballpark. And your question about land, we do um, uh, have three pieces of land that we own. Two, I would say you, you aren't big enough to put a school on them. Uh, one potentially could be an elementary site uh, that we own uh, northwest. Um, it's not large enough for anything bigger than a, uh, an elementary. And then we'd also have to do, it's partially owned by the city as well, so we'd have to do something with them in order to, to build on that site. So, and I, we have been uh, <clears throat> unofficially been looking out at different pieces of land that are for sale and potentially might be in the locations where we might need something. So we've kind of been doing some work on that, but our, our, our charge is to bring uh, that information back to the committee and then uh, at some time we'll roll out the ideas to the community and get their input. Uh, one final comment on this. If you look back through the last two facilities task forces, this is actually about the time and place that it's been projected that the district would need some, something like this as well. So if you've read the documents, this actually isn't new news. It's actually fairly timely. It's actually referenced in a later board item as well. Yeah. And I, I think another thing uh, is that we um, probably looking at for the 18-19 school year, we'll have to do some type of boundary adjustments. Um, you know, as you recall, once the addition to Hoover's done, we'll be pulling the preschools out of some of the elementary, so we may have to do some shuffling around of kids to balance things out a little bit more. Um, the good part is that we recently purchased a, a software that allows us to do that on our own, so we can kind of say, well, what would happen if we moved the boundary two blocks this way? It tells us how that impacts our enrollment in different schools. So we'll start doing uh, some of that work, and, and but I anticipate we'll probably have to do some type of boundary adjustments for the 18-19 school year. And, and I guess it's important to point that's only a temporary solution. Oh, yes. Because that, that buys time, and ultimately we'll need build, more building capacity. And you can e either get that two ways. You can add more building, or you can extend the time which buildings are used. Those are the two options uh, that you look at. So as we play this or think about all this and get all the information and we'll bring it out and I'm sure there'll be lots of lively public debate about some of the options that get thrown out there but that's you know that's part of the process one other oh, go ahead mrs becker um one other thought i i just want to thank um the um, mike and scott and john for being very willing to call other districts and say you know, other districts, I mean, we've heard that they have, you know, they have different schedules. They've done different things with remodeling buildings and, and whatever. And they've been very willing, <clears throat> very willing just to, you know, to give these other districts a call. So it's, so I, again, I want, you know, the public to know that we're really trying to, we're not necessarily trying to create a new wheel here, but we also, you know, we want to look at our facilities and use them most efficiently. Um, and see what other districts have done and can it work here can we tweak it can it not you know so so it, it sounds to me like it's still you're still very much in the brainstorming phase of just putting Extremely lots of different things on the on the table too I'd say consider. we're further than brainstorming okay. but not much further okay, <laughs> okay I just I just they're all, they're all collecting data now collecting yeah. the data Collecti yeah. collect, collecting the, the data so um you know I just wanted to make it clear to our representatives to the media that from the media that we don't have anything that we're putting before the public no. at this point no we just thought it'd be best to you know start talking about this now Absolutely. so it's not a surprise for anybody right good any other committee reports okay consent agenda this is an action item are there any items that board members would like removed for separate consideration hearing none all those in favor move approval, move approval. second so, okay, whatever. All those, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, opposed? Motion carries. Efficient and effective operations, 
district-sponsored group health and dental insurance and flexible benefit plan open enrollment period for the 2018 calendar year. This is an information item, Mr. Munoz. Yes, Mr. Carlson, Executive Director of Finance, will uh, provide this information for us tonight. So we'll be making sure that all eligible uh, employees do the required paperwork or the online form uh, to get that done. What we don't know at this point, and we will not know this until September 27th, is what the health and dental insurance premiums will be. We'll get our final costs in uh, on how the plan has been doing through August, and we'll look at those numbers late September, and then we'll be advised on what percentage increase the premium rates would have to go up. Because most of our uh, contracts have a fixed amount of benefit, uh, that means any increase is likely going to fall on the employee's shoulders. Uh, one thing that will change in the health plan this year, the Employee Insurance Committee met on June 1st. This is a group, there's one employee from each group, so there's a principal, a teacher, off schedule, clerical, etc. Uh, they did decide to increase the co-pays on the prescription drugs. Uh, that will help the increase be not as bad, although it's not going to take much of a bite out of the premium increase, but it will help. So, any questions on that? Thank you, Mr. Carlson. 7.02, approval of Alpine Ski Agreement. This is a briefing item, Mr. Munoz. Yes, uh, Mr. Mark Queasley, Century Activities Director, will brief us on this item. Good evening, Madam Chair, Mr. Munoz, Ms. Edgar, and board members. Before you is the uh, briefing item on the Alpine Ski. Alpine Ski is a lot like lacrosse has been for several years where it was a non-school funded program and then we moved lacrosse into being a funded program. Um, Alpine Ski now has come forward with a uh, proposal that we have reviewed through Activities Council to um, they would pay 100% of the cost for this upcoming school year and the next school year, the Alpine Ski would pay 75%, district would pay 25%. The following year, it would be a 50-50 split, and then the last year of the programming, we would fully fund the Alpine Ski. So that's the resolution before you. Any questions? Mr. Barlow. Uh, so what are we talking number-wise? dollar wise that'll vary just a little bit and as we get closer to this uh, for next year's budget we'll have um, some harder numbers on that but right now um, they charge three hundred dollars per participant for that fee we would choose not to go that high and put it in a um, a rate that is consistent with our other programming so currently we are refunded about $8,000 above and beyond the participation fees um, in our current agreement. So they come up with that dollar amount at the end. Um, but based on salaries, transportation costs, um, before the next time around, I certainly could get you some numbers of what we would be looking at for that phase in piece, but yeah. And then yeah. as you, I'm sorry. No. And then as, you, as we transition from a uh, club team to a um, school sanctioned activity um, will these um, will participation be on a tryout you make the team or how will selection on the team occur currently we take everyone that's interested in alpine ski now that's kind of um, could be dangerous too if you've never skied and um, <laughs> that part of it but uh, we also have a large number of schools that help our uh, participation numbers currently. Um, Century and Mayo actually have enough students to fulfill a team uh, in both boys and girls, but John Marshall does not, so we use Chatfield, Wabashaw, Kellogg, Lewiston, Altura, um, Byron, 
um, as other schools to help us with that. And so we, we don't anticipate closing the program. Oh, Mr. Yeah, just a reminder, uh, not too long ago we approved increasing uh, the participation fee and all of the different activities. So uh, our hope is that eventually when it gets to uh, we're funding it 100% that that additional cost that we're generating uh, by increasing the cost will help make it a wash or very close to being a wash. Mr. Smith. My question is, I understood you correctly, Mr. Silver. Currently charging $300 per participant, and based on that, at the end of the year, there's been, we're reflecting $8,000 more than what's needed, currently needed. Correct, in order to get it back to cost neutral. So, How many students are participating now? Um, we have about maybe 20 students district wide that are participating. So it's not a very large number, um, but it, it is increasing on a yearly basis for us. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Quisley. Yes. Seven point oh three approval of contract for Dreamline Program Consulting Services. This is a briefing item, Mr. Munoz. Yes, I'm going to have Jackie Peterson, Executive Director, of Elementary and Secondary Education, brief us. Just a reminder: this is the program. Oh, a few weekly updates ago, I gave you some information about uh, this program, and Jackie's going to share a little more with you about that program. Jackie, can you use that mic? That mic is dead. I'm sorry. I killed it. I think that was the last one up there. <laughs> Chair Wickman, Superintendent Munoz, and members of the board, we are so pleased to be engaged in this partnership with the Senna Foundation and their Dreamline program. Um, we have been working with them over the past several weeks to put programs in place in our three high schools and Kellogg Middle School. Um, they have had success in St. Paul Public Schools and other metro area schools and recently over the past year in St. Cloud Public Schools. Um, and so we're following that model. Um, we currently have uh, five coaches um, that the Dreamline Foundation has um, deemed appropriate for our, our schools. Um, some of these folks are people we've worked with in our school setting um, before. Um, each school, when fully staffed, would have three coaches. One would be a lead coach and then two Promise Fellows. They would be located right on site at the, uh, at their schools, at the schools and would work directly with students. Um, the site coordinator would have a caseload of 20 students that they would work directly with, and the Promise Fellows would have 10 students that they would work with. Um, we're currently looking at um, the, the um, benchmark requirements for being served in this program. Um, and um, we know we'll have quite a list of kids that will um, be eligible and the administration in those buildings will have the opportunity to help select uh, students that will, will receive the services. Um, the, the mission of Santa Foundation I'd like to share with you. I think it says a lot about what um, their work is about. Their mission is to empower youth by supporting and promoting educational attainment through in-school and after-school support, improve lives by providing programs that strengthen physical health and social and emotional development, and unite communities by advancing diversity, equity, and community well-being. Our schools are um, excited for this opportunity to work closely with this foundation. This is the program I wrote to you a few weeks ago about uh, they received some additional state funding thanks to Senator Nelson to bring the program to our district and I know the schools are really excited to have that additional support for, for students to help them be successful. Ms. Marvin. Two questions. Would these coaches be in addition to or in place of the current success coaches? It'll be in addition to. In addition to, yes. okay. And you got the criteria for how kids qualify to get that kind of additional support. Right, Dreamline, Dreamline provides the criteria. We look at, um, at risk or the risk factors such as attendance, um, course 
uh, uh, failing grades, behavior, and students need to have one or two of those risk factors, um, not more than that. Um, if they're already receiving services, like uh, some of our schools who are implementing AVID, um, they wouldn't be eligible then. Um, if they're in special education for more than 60% of their day, they also wouldn't be candidates for the program. Okay, and my second question, because yep. the first one was long. There are four secondary schools that will have this program there. Mm -hmm. Are the, uh, the other ones are opting out or? They're not opting out. Our first attempt was to get all six of yeah. our. Um, yeah, they just didn't feel at this time they could take on all our high schools and middle schools. Uh, they said four. Uh, and we selected Kellogg because the other two middle schools are pursuing AVID. Okay. Their, their, their goal would be to reach out to those other two schools, but to begin with, uh, we're starting with these four. Mr. Smith. So by sense, we're, they're, they're basically, the, through their foundation, we're getting $4 for every dollar a week, but four. Right. So we put up five and they put up 20. For yep. So right. 25 for Correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's a good value. Yeah. Yeah. Our, our, our buildings see this as a great value. They're putting $5,000 okay. forward. Um, well, the one's good. Right, to get three, <laughs> three staff members. So, yeah. I have a quick question for you. So could you tell us a little bit more about um, it says the in-school staff is comprised of full-time youth workers. Could you talk a little bit more about that? And are these folks brought into the community or are they people who are already here? Well, the foundation really encouraged us to put names forward for us to reach out. So we worked with our equity specialists, our administrators in each of the buildings to get the word out, to get those postings out to the community. Um, personally, I had worked with a, a wonderful para at uh, Fridell who left um, Fridell uh, to pursue other careers, uh, another career hoping to make a little more money than we can pay our paras and um, thankfully found he uh, really missed working with kids um, and so he interviewed, um, I told the Senna Foundation I'd bet a paycheck on this guy that he would do a great job and they love him and he, um, he actually will be at Mayo High School. So that's an example of we were able to um, to provide names to the Senna Foundation and they worked with the, the people that we put forward. We still need uh, people. Um, and so if, if there are people um, here that have um, connections and uh, really they, these people, our, our coaches need to have great ability to make connections with kids and um, build those trusting relationships and, and that's the biggest um, part of this job. Mr. Barlow. Uh, two questions. One, uh, would these uh, coaches, uh, consultants, tutors, coaches be district employees? And second, um, uh, are the, is this program a result of a grant? And if so, what's the life of the grant? Well, first of all, the district employee piece, um, they, for, for all intents and pur purposes, are district employees in terms of accessing our district email, being able to work with the um, the students' information. We've worked with our legal counsel on that, so we're, we're the, the the coaches will not be hindered by not having up-to-date information about attendance and so on. Um, so we want them to feel like they're they're our staff members, but they are hired through uh, the Senna Foundation. And in terms of life of the grant, I, I don't know that I can speak to that. Yeah, we it's not we don't have a long-term commitment from them. Um, they seem to feel that. Um, when I go back uh, the next funding cycle that they'll be able to get that renewed. Um, so we'd, I think we're at least counting for two years that they have two years of funding from the state. Um, and that's actually be a good time for us to evaluate the program after two years and see if they do continue with funding. If it's something that we want to continue committing to as well. Um, the feedback we've gotten from other districts that have used this program has been very successful and helped a certain target of students. And uh, I agree with Jackie, they, when we met with them, they really want the workers to come from the community. They want them to come from our community and uh, look like the students that they're serving. And they work extremely hard to recruit those types of individuals. And as Jackie said, we, we've, reached out and tried to make pe uh, recommend people that we thought might be a good fit for these positions. Mr. Smith? So if we have a total of 12 tutor coaches, how many students, and maybe send us on, maybe we'll just look at the wheel, but the site, 
if they can they get three, two, three? Yeah, the, the site coordinator um, will have 20 students on their caseload. So there's one site coordinator at each building and the Promise Fellows will have 10. So that's 40 students. 40 students. Okay. Uh, is, that, is, this, is this timely? This you know, that it's a breathing element. Yes, I was going to, after we had all your questions answered, we would appreciate getting this uh, oh, yeah. approved. And we, as Jackie mentioned, we did, uh, we worked with legal counsel to make sure that we were uh, covering all the bases on giving them access to information that, that they need. Do you have a question? Ms. Seelinger. Thanks. Uh, not so much a, a question, but maybe a point of information as the, the uh, work I did looking at this, I thought was, um, you know, I, I admit I had a little bit of trepidation because this is a really new program. Um, and I did watch some of the uh, uh, legislative session where they presented there. Um, so just to share a teeny bit with my uh, fellow board members, um, the students mentored, this is according to uh, what I read today, students mentored through the Dreamline program in St. Paul Public Schools during the 2015-16 school year saw a 64% increase in A grades earned Conversely, D grades declined by 55% and F grades by 18%. So I thought that was, you know, a pretty remarkable number. And then just a piece from St. Cloud is that um, they noticed the behavioral reductions. And I, I really appreciated that this was kind of, um, it seemed like a very holistic approach. Mm -hmm. there, there's the academic piece, but there's also that social, emotional, and uh, behavioral piece as well. And so um, I, I thought it was quite remarkable. and. Um, would love to, love to have uh, great results in Rochester that could be shared at the legislature next time by the foundation. I think one of the key elements is the, the training that Santa Foundation puts into the uh, development of our coaches. Um, every Friday they'll be working together uh, with a, with a um, uh, district manager and I, I just received a whole list of dates, probably 12 or 14 different trainings they'll be receiving over the next month or so. So it's not just plunking people down and saying, go make relationships. A lot of that, that's a huge part of it. They'll be uh, highly trained to, to um, leverage those, con uh, those uh, relationships. I have one question for you, another one. Um, how does this um, line up with our equity specialists? Will there be interaction with them at all, or is the, are they going to be just two totally separate programs? We don't have anything formal set up, but we fully expect, um, you know, it's, I think it's the same. Um, as uh, our schools with, with success labs and those kinds of sure. things. We want these to work hand in hand so kids see okay. uh, that okay. unified uh, support. Okay. And, and being the direct supervisor of the equity specialist, oh. we've, we've had <laughs> conversations about this and really they see their role as supporting in any way they can. They're not, uh, they're not gonna go in and say, hey, I'm part of your program, but I'm a resource for you. I can uh, support you any way that we can. Thank you. Ms. Marvin. Down the road, then, it's possible that you'll compare, the, that we'll compare the results from this with the results from AVID and decide that we need both, that, that one's maybe better than the other. Not, I, we can do that. The, the, only, the, only, the only difference is the, the Dreamline program is really um, heavily reliant on the state funding, and where the AVID is pretty much... Uh, all district funded. I mean, we we pay for all that cost. So if I guess the point I'm making is, if Dreamline shows up to be more successful than Avid, we can say, hey, we want to expand. But unless they continue to get more or state funding, they wouldn't have the capacity to to expand well, it. Well, and it sounds, I mean, it sounds like it's absolutely based on relationships, which is so important. And I know Avid's a different uh, different approach. My other question, though, is, um, and, and a good deal for Rochester, 5000 per school, but if the total cost per school is $25,000, most of which will not be paid by the district, is that enough to support three coaches or tutors at each school? Well, we haven't done, done the hiring part of it. I, I know what they posted, the salaries. Uh, I saw the postings. Um, but, again, they're not, they're not being paid from our, our district funds, so I hope they can pay the, the contracts. Oh, okay, so, but that's the foundation. That's their, right. that's right. their okay. business, and I, and I understand they were very good to work with as far as the coaches they hired. They, 
um, they treated our coaches very fairly. Okay. It's, I Mr. guess it's pretty clear the coaches aren't likely doing this just for the money. <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> They're doing this the because they care and they want to yeah. make a difference in kids' lives. Yeah. Absolutely. Great. Anything else? Thank you, Ms. Peterson. This looks like a, a good program, so um, I would entertain a motion move, to move, move to action. Second. Second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of moving this to action, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It is now an action item. Be it resolved that the School Board of Independent School District 535 does hereby approve the contract for Dreamline Program Consulting Services at the cost of $100,000 to be paid over the course of the school year in $10,000 increments. Second. Any more discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Seven point oh four approval of phase one bid and proposal packages for early childhood addition at Hoover Elementary School. This is a briefing item, Mr. Munoz. Yes, at this time, Mr. Scott Sheridan, Executive Director of Facilities. Uh, he's going to be joined by representatives from Knutson Construction and CRW Architects. And I'm not sure if Bill's Bill coming up. No, no. Good evening, board members. I'm here to brief you on the phase one bids and proposal packages that we received back for the early childhood edition at Hoover Elementary. It also includes a little work with the indoor air quality project as well, uh, particularly for the roof. I have with me uh, Jason Woodhouse on the far end. He is the architect from CRW, CRW Architects that was hired to uh, design the addition and the indoor air quality project at Hoover. Then I have Tom Limer, who was hired by the board or through a, uh, a briefing with the board for, uh, from Knutson Construction as the construction manager uh, as agency. And his assistant in this project will be Kean McWaters, who's also from Knutson Construction. I thought it'd be valuable to have these other three players here to answer any questions that you might have, uh, particularly about this project, as uh, they have intimate knowledge of the design and uh, this particular bid phase project or the, the phase one bids. As you know, on uh, August 1st, you also uh, approved the certificates of participation in the amount of $8.1 million for the early childhood edition, and you also approved $3.5 million in general obligation bonds for the Hoover Elementary Indoor Air Quality Project. And since that time, CRW Architects collaborated with, collaborated with district staff and with Knutson Construction to design uh, the early childhood edition. And it, it's gone through multiple phases of design, uh, adding, subtracting, uh, material, scope, all different types of things. And now we're to a, a project where it includes 21 classrooms, multiple small group rooms, a large motor room, office space, and the total addition piece for the Hoover addition for the early childhood part would be about 36,720 square feet. And that would be for the $8.1 million part of that particular project. Knutson and CRW Architects, along with uh, the coordinator of construction services and his staff. Uh, they worked up a phase one competitive bid package for this project. It includes site work. It includes uh, construction of the shell of the early childhood addition. Uh, it also includes uh, a part of the indoor air quality project as far as the roofing only. So we put the roofing for the uh, addition and also for the indoor air quality project together because it just makes sense to do it all at once and together. Through this bid package, they came up with 11 different uh, bid packages. Uh, one of them is for the roof, and that's since that's a high dollar piece, and it also includes 
phases for the early childhood and for the indoor air quality, we went best value uh, for the roof project. For the other 10 pieces of the, of the phase, they're all competitive bids, and we went low bid. Uh, on August 7th, we, they were posted, and then on August 24th, the bids were due, and we opened them up. And there was, of the 10 big packages that were low bid, uh, the concrete low bid was to Joseph Company for $399,800. The masonry was to Daryl Berger Masonry for $491,000. The structural steel material went to Thumbeck Steel, $199,100. The structural steel installation went to KMH Erectors at $119,100. Then the curtain wall entrance and oops, excuse me windows went to Ford Metro for $109,000. Uh, the earthwork and utilities went to Edge Contracting for $615,218. The asphalt paving low bid was Rochester Sand and Gravel for $209,042. The site concrete the low bid was Comet Concrete. $119,750, and the landscaping piece low bid went to Erosion Control Incorporated for $74,000. There was a, a tenth package regarding uh, framing and drywall, and the low bid on that was came in at $135,961, and that came in from RTL Construction. Through uh, consultation with Knutson Construction and input from the architects, uh, it was their determination that that bid uh, exceeded the budgetary limitations as far as what their expectation of what it should have cost to complete the phase, that particular phase. And so their recommendation was to ask the board to reject phase package or bid package 9A for the framing and drywall. And our intent is then to rebid it and also include any framing and drywall that would be coming with the Hoover edition. Did I get that correct? Okay, thank you. And so that bid package, that would be in included in the next bid package for the framing and drywall. It isn't that critical of a piece for this initial phase one in order to get the shell built before winter or in the winter, but we will be bringing that back to you as, as a later item. So we're asking you to approve the nine low bid packages and then the roof bid, which I explained was a, a best value. Um, to further give you an idea how we did that, this is uh, roofing package 7A. There were selected facility staff that, uh, along with the representative from Knudsen Construction, who happened to be uh, Kean McWaters, we rated individually rated uh, the risk assessment value additions and the expertise. Uh, it was a blind rating, where uh, I believe four of us rated. The scores were compiled, and then we invited all three companies that put in proposals for the roof in for an interview and we in interviewed individually the project manager of each of those companies and the site supervisor of each of those roofing contractors scored each of them independently as well again tabulated the scores and in the end uh, merit roofing scored highest in the tabulation sheet with 959 points and Merritt's roofing bid was $919,615. And uh, as you look at your bid tabulation or your proposal tabulation for the roofing project, you'll see that um, it's not a low bid. It was a best value. And per the best value rules that we follow with uh, um, Kashiwagi uh, best value process, if that 959 points, if the second place bid or second place contractor scored within 5% of uh, the, the top point getter, then we would treat the package as a low bid and take the low bid. But the second uh, contractor scored outside that 5%, and so we followed the, the rules of the best value that we signed up for and are asking you to approve the merit roofing bid, which I said was $919,615. Long explanation. Yes. I'm not going to ask you to repeat all those Thank things. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Smith? 
So I assume you want us, you prefer us to take action given the timing of this. You want to get, get this up before we learn, the sooner we move, the, the better. Yes. Mr. Barlow? Uh, I was curious. Uh, as I looked at the plans, I was just look, I'm a retired firefighter and used to do plans examination for our department. Uh, so I was looking, of course, for fire alarm, sprinkler system. Uh, those are probably on a different set of uh, drawings. Correct. Uh, but uh, in terms of the bid, uh, where normally would those uh, costs be uh, shown? The fire alarm? And sprinkler system upgrades, yeah. Go ahead. Be because of the timing, we had to split the project into two phases. Okay. Phase one being strictly to get the building up. So all the infrastructure that goes in inside would be, would be the shell. And the mechanical infrastructure, your fire alarm, everything you just mentioned will be bid. Uh, we're targeting the end of Late October to issue oh. that for bids. Okay. So all of those items will come back in. Okay. And, and I don't know if I can add just a, a comment from the reason we did this, we always felt that the budget was very tight. We had to watch the budget. Um, I think to maybe give you some comfort, we're right on budget right now, and we still have the contingency we started with. So to give you some comfort to maybe approve the phase one, um, hopefully that maybe puts some, a little bit of ease on what your, some other questions you might have budget related. So we're targeting right where we need to be with this first phase for approval, and then we'll retabulate uh, when the second phase comes out. And our plan for the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing is to do that best value as well. So we'll, we'll have a lot of uh, oversight as far as the selection process for each of those three pieces as well. Yeah, I, I uh, they've met multiple times and a few changes, and I've attended a couple of those meetings, and I think they pretty understood that uh, the budget is what it is, and there's no room to go over that. And I, I appreciate the work that you, you've all done to, to do that and to really keep that in mind as we move forward. And I, I have confidence in this group for making sure that we'll be able to get the project completely done uh, right on budget. Mr. Schlusner. Uh, one of my questions has already been answered in regards to being on budget because you gave a bunch of individual prices. Uh, but something you pointed out is with the roofing, it's the new and the existing structure that's getting re-roofed essentially, right? Yes. So, yeah, something to point out from the public point of view is that's essentially a savings as well. It's because, you know, with buildings, you replace roofs, and this is a more cost-effective way to save the taxpayers' dollars of doing them both at the same time. Yeah. So it's something to think about pointing out down the road of this, yes, this this cost, but it saves the district this much money in doing it this way as well. That's an excellent point, yes. <laughs> Mrs. Becker. Um, so with the framing and drywall, so how much... Over budget was the 135. Um, what we had kind of figured just for the building shell, it's pretty minimal amount of framing. We were thinking it would be more around $100,000 range. Okay. Um, I think with the limited amount of work that they have with that and not including the interior stuff, it inflated their cost. I think we'll get a better value if we put them all together, bid the remodel, the addition, and the exterior at the same time. Mr. Smith. We're not anticipating cost overruns on, on the second phase. So we, we, we're thinking we're going to be able to stay within what we have. Just, you know, once we get the thing up, we're kind of pretty much <laughs> got to finish it. So, I mean, we through this tonight. We're, we're all in at that point. So we're not, we're, we're pretty, I mean, nobody can guarantee anything because you haven't bid it yet. And, you know, something happened tomorrow that changes pricing, we all, you know, the unforeseen. But based on where we are today, you don't, you, you're, you're anticipating that we will be able to stay within the budget. That, that's correct. That's correct. The benefit we have with this particular project is it's early, uh, we're going to be bidding it fairly early. The project, particularly the indoor air quality piece, isn't going to be started until next June, but we're going to have some fairly definitive numbers here in the fall. On our past projects for indoor air quality, sometimes we don't get that bid out until February, March, and by then a lot of the contractors have already got their summer work arranged and so you, historically, theoretically, you would think that you would probably be paying higher prices for later bids like that, where on an early bid like this, theoretically, it would tell you that 
if they aren't locked into a project next summer, you might get a better bid now. Be Theoretically. The work, they'll be hungry for the work. Exactly. Theoretically. Ms. Zielinger. Um, thank you for your presentation. I, I followed everything, so that was great. Um, and this, just a point kind of beyond your, uh, beyond your presentation, um, because you're working on an existing school site, and I know that there's changes there, um, just knowing that that everything will be smooth and careful around the children. I see Mr. Eversman here as well, and I know I'm, I'm going to be sure that he is reassuring our Hoover families that um, our students will be watched out for, and there still will be parking on Hoover fun night and all the crazy things. I, I go by quite, a, quite often and, and see, the, see the new things going on there, but um, I appreciate your presentation, and um, I think this is a great opportunity for students in our district. Thank you. We did take into consideration that we knew that school was going to be going on and that was part of the process here that they needed to accommodate that to have minimal impact on the school and Principal Eversman has been involved in the process since the beginning and has had input on it and he's been fantastic to work with. So, so far everything's going along very well and everything's very cohesive. Thank you. Move this action. Second. First and second, please. It's been moved to, this, it's, been moved and seconded. it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of moving this item to action, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It is now an action item. Be it resolved that the school board of Independent School District 535 rejects big bid package 9A in the amount of $135,961 and approve bid packages 3A, 4A, 5A, 5B, 8B, 31A, 32A, 32B, 32C, and best value proposal package 7A in the amount of $3,255,625 for the early <coughs> childhood addition and indoor qu air quality project at Hoover Elementary. Second. Is there any more discussion? Any more questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs> 7 7.05 approval of the 2017 2018 rights, rules, regulations, and procedural code of the Rochester Public Schools. This is a briefing item, Mr. Munoz. Yes, and I don't plan on going over every page in there <laughs> with you. Uh, anyway, uh, basically this is uh, something that we may want to talk about in the future, the need of having a discipline handbook and a rights, rules, and regs. Uh, we've been talking for a couple of years, but I think we're to the point where we would recommend consolidating the two. However, I think it's the right rules and regs is referenced in eight different policies, so we'll have to go in and change that word to discipline handbook or whatever. But anyway, um, basically what this includes is all of the uh, policies that are really relevant to students and families that that may uh, they may encounter during their time as a student in our district and then also some other information and I'm just going to highlight the information that is not policy related and and try to explain a little bit uh, why that might be in there the first section is uh, student disability non-discrimination this is uh, basically giving them information about 504 so parents are aware of that uh, on the next page, the student sex non-discrimination, uh, just a reminder that it's an equal educational opportunity for all students and we do not unlawfully discriminate on the basis of sex. Um, and then I'm going to go on, the others, the next sections are all uh, board policies. The next one that's not the full policy is under student lockers and basically that just informs parents that the district has a right to inspect there's locker at any time. We can do that anytime we, we choose to. And then there's a bunch of policies after that. And then uh, there's just a statement about code of student conduct. We used to have parts of the policy in here. Now that the entire policy 506 is in the handbook, we just made reference that the policy is in the behavior handbook. The next section talks about participation extracurricular, extracurricular activities. 
that just talks about the district eligibility guidelines and that they have to follow the Minnesota High School League rules. And then there's a bunch of policies after that. And then the next section that's uh, protection and privacy of pu uh, pupil records, it talks about what is direct information, which means that is public information and what is not considered directory information. And then there's a section on student medication that talks about uh, that we will administer medication in accordance to uh, state law and district policy. Uh, immunization requirements is also, there's a, a brief information in there about student, a student may not enroll until they have the uh, correct immunization or the exempt form. Uh, and then student health, it talks about the district will follow public health guidelines when health related policies and, and whenever there's an outbreak or something, we take guidance from the Elmstead Public Health and we use them to direct us through uh, communicating to parents about that information. Same thing with infectious disease. Uh, there's information here about head lice and we follow the uh, public health guidelines on that. Uh, information about vision and hearing screening. Uh, talks about the screening that we provide and that if we find something that uh, a student that doesn't pass either the vision hearing screening, we notify the parents. Um, and then there's information about the DNR, DNI orders. D school district staff will not accept or honor any request to withhold emergency care for any student. Informing them about that. Information about uh, student medical emergencies that we're going to provide reasonable emergency care and assistance when a student is undergoing a medical emergency. Uh, then there's information about student surveys in there. And then a bunch of policies. And then there's a, a section in there about the Pledge of Allegiance so that we will recite, informing parents that we recite the pledge uh, one or more times each week. Uh, information about the district wellness policies in there and we added a little bit about uh, food sold for fundraising must meet the FDA smart snacks requirement that's new uh, and then there's information about transportation and how you qualify if you reside two miles or further away from the uh, your assigned school and Uh, there's information about crisis management, just informing parents that each school is required to have a crisis management plan and that's something that we um, review annually. And then there's media access that students may be interviewed on school, no student will be interviewed on school property or school district sponsored activities by the media without administrative approval. And we also, we don't have an interview, but we typically will um, get permission from the parent before we allow a student to have communication, interact with the media. And then the last few pages are, this is from MDE on statewide testing and informing them that they have a right to opt out, but also giving them information on why it's important that their student participates in the state testing. So that's just a quick run through, but most of the, the policies are in here, ones that are most commonly uh, experienced by students in, in the school system. Mr. Smith. Has this document been distributed in, in, in uh, 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 draft form to It's students? ready to go. Okay. Uh, we Since we're starting school, we've published it. Published yeah, the sooner <laughs> we can get this formally approved, we uh, will send it to the printer and get it out to students, uh, making sure that they have a copy of it. Well, I'd, I'd really like to commend the superintendent from reducing it. I think the original draft version was 64 pages, and yes. now we're down to 50. So progress in the right direction yeah. and I think it was probably due to mostly not printing out all the policies and right right which is but I, I also think it's really it makes it easier for parents because they have a document right on hand and they don't have to try to navigate board docs to find right. the policy and figure it all out so um, as a I was gonna say as a former parent I'm still a parent <laughs> always will be as a parent of students who went through the system this is much appreciated Ms. Ellinger. 
Um, so, uh, Superintendent, how does how is the distribution of this particular document handled? Does every student get every family get a paper co copy? Every student is no. Lying? I don't know. If, I think every student gets one, or every family gets one copy. It's not like the handbook. Handbook every, every student, student gets copy. one, but this is just one per family. Any translated copies? Pardon me. Any translated copies? We have the ability to translate in the. I think the five major languages that we, and usually that's on a request, and then we print off copies in that language. Ms. Becker. Um, I know that, that you just briefly mentioned earlier that, well, maybe we should combine the two. Um, but since we only have to print one of these for each family, and we have to print one of the other ones for each student, I would just check on the cost. I mean, because yeah. if we're adding 50 pages, because then we're basically printing both of them for every student. Right. So I don't know. If right. Well, the hope, too, is that we can even continue to re reduce the number of pages that we have to have. I'd like to move this to action. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of moving this to action, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? It is now an action item. And I will read it once I get back to it. Be it resolved that the School Board of Independent School District 535 approve the 2017-2018 Rights, Rules, Regulations, and Procedural Code of the Rochester Public Schools. So moved. Second been moved and seconded. Is there any more discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. I'd really like to thank all the staff and the cabinet and everybody who has worked so hard on this document. It's, it's a team of quite a large number of people that has really worked to put this together, and I very much appreciate that. Ms. Seelinger. Uh, as to not only to echo your thanks, but also uh, encourage our families and students to look over this handbook that we have worked so hard on and a lot of uh, questions we might hear in the public can be answered right there in that handbook. So, just... 7.06, closed session on property. Pursuant to Minnesota Statute 13D.05, Subdivision 3, I make a motion to move into closed session to discuss potential real estate transactions. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We are recessing or moving? Recess. Recessing at 6.57 p.m. Be convening at 7.20 p.m. and this meeting is adjourned at 7.20 p.m. Correct.